Let's begin with prayer. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Could somebody possibly run upstairs and look and turn if anybody knows how to do that? Thing? Turn down. PG. Just dial me down a little bit. I'm scaring myself. So, and I get loud on the sermon today. I'll probably be louder by second service. So I don't want to scare you. So Romans chapter 11. Today is uh, going to be uh, a focus, continued focus on the doctrine of the church, the teaching of the church. And then we're going to make a dramatic shift then into sanctification. And that's Romans chapter 12. Now you all know that's assuming we get to Romans chapter 12. But when you get to Romans chapter 12 at your house later today because you can't get enough of God's word, then you will get to the sanctification section. Okay? All right. Theme verse for Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And we're calling this an adventure, so an adventure, an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity. Romans 11, 1 to 10, let's go. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would be no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to attain, obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. All right. So when, you have to go back then to Romans chapter 1, really the very beginning, really just the context of this book in general. For those of you that may not have been here, Romans is written at a time where the Gentile Christians have been there present in Rome. But the Jews had been forced out of Rome and then now have returned and find that the churches are going on a little bit different. So you've got a dynamic here of Jews and Gentiles, of Germans and French people, no, just kidding, of Jews and Gentiles here. And so with that, then, as you think about this, think about how Paul is writing here. Has God rejected his people? By no means. Who has done the rejecting here? His people have done the rejecting of him. And also note here that Paul is speaking as a what? As a Jew. As a Jew. He obviously has not been rejected. He continues to be a faithful Christian, one who's converted into Christ. But as the first question says, why might the people of Israel conclude that God had rejected them? Why might that be that they would think that? Okay, so remember, he's got promise of, all right, he hasn't come yet. Now remember, if you're a Jewish that, a person that's not a Jewish Christian, yeah, you're going to believe that not even Jesus has come yet. Um, but he hasn't come there at the end days. Um, and then what was the first part you said there, Sharon? 
And the persecution has continued there in the face of the church, all right? But there's a little bit more to that. Why do the Jews tend to believe that they are saved? Just because they're Jews. We talked about this last week. Those that think that they are going to be saved just because of their heritage will not be saved. Just because grandma's name is there at church on the roster doesn't mean you're getting in to heaven. It doesn't work that way. And for any of us to think that way would be an error. And so the Jews then are rejected by their own misunderstanding of one, they're saved by their heritage, two, they're saved by their works. That they are earning their favor before God. Remember, as you see everything play out in the conversations between the Pharisees and Jesus, what does it always boil down to? Jesus, you're not doing things right. It's all about what you do. So, how do we fall in the same line of thinking? Well, we fall in the same line of thinking whenever we're thinking we're saved by our heritage or we're saved by our works. And so, what encouragement then does Paul give? What encouragement does he give? If you turn to verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. You might remember in the book of Isaiah, he has a couple of kids and they have really, really strange names. One is Mahir Shalahashbaz, all right, something you've named your kid. And the other one is Shir Yashuv. All right? Shir Yashuv in Hebrew means a remnant shall remain. His very kid's name was prophecy of what was actually going to take place. That a remnant would still exist no matter how much the church would be pared down. And so here you see in the book of Romans that continue to be upheld as a remnant of God's people remains even in spite of the refining of the church. How many of you believe right now that the church is going through some pretty major refining? Yeah. What does it take in order to refine metal? Heat. How many of us like to get burned? Not a one of us. It's painful. It's awful. And, but that is the reality of what's happening. The church is being refined, and as it's being refined, unfortunately, there are those who will fall away. And yet, there will be those who will become what? Even more firm in their faith. They will cling all the more tight to Christ in the midst of this. So we just had Reformation Sunday last week and Confirmation Sunday last week. Revelation 2 verse 10. Be faithful to the point of death and so receive the crown of everlasting life. What questions? There's two questions in the rite of confirmation that we ask our kids when they are publicly affirming the faith given to them in their baptism that they would be faithful to the point of Death, And even if death would get in the way, they would rather choose death than turn away from what they have confessed before Christ. That they will not turn away from this confession and church. That's why it's a joy, actually, and you can be proud of being a Lutheran. Because the Lutherans continue... This church body of which you're a part, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, has made very clear that we will not turn from what? God's word. What is at the lead? If you look at, if you were here at our voters meeting here uh, a couple of weeks ago, then in that meeting, in the governance structure, what is at the very top? It's God's word is what governs us. The lens we look at it is through our Lutheran confessions, but it's God's word that actually directs and leads and guides. Scripture tells us that Israel failed to obtain what they were seeking. 
Why did they fail to obtain what they were seeking? Why did they fail to obtain it? <laughs> Say what? Hardened. Yeah, their hearts are hardened. And they continue, when their hearts are hardened, do you ever get stuck in your ways? Hmm, I just asked a bunch of German Lutherans a question that is the most rhetorical question. Now I can say that, I'm not German, so everything, so of course I'm never stubborn. So just don't ask my wife that, or don't put that online. <laughs> but in the midst of it, when we have a hardened heart, we tend to dig our heels in all the more. And with the Jews, yeah, why would they not? This is the way we've always done things. Yeah. That's never been said in the Lutheran church, right? No. Yeah. It's never been said in your household, right? Just think about it. When you have a tradition, like it's a Christmas tradition, it's coming up, and someone comes in the family and proposes that they're going to do something different, <laughs> oh my goodness. I've often wondered how World War III would start. That's how it happens. Yeah. You don't suggest change. Oh my goodness. Do you know what the issue with change is now? It's not the fear of change. People aren't afraid of change. They're afraid of loss. That's what's so hard with this pandemic. It's a grieving reality of the fact that we have lost something that we held dear. And in many respects, it is with regard to the body, the community that we have as believers, where the fabric, the very threads are literally being pulled at us. And that's what we feel. We want that connectivity that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ to return to what it once was. And that hurts to experience that pull. Okay? So they failed to obtain it because they were hard of heart. But they'd also dug in, if they were thinking that it was works righteousness that they were saved by, well then, in that case, they're not going to be able to earn salvation. They can't do it. They cannot do it. You can't win salvation by something you do. Just as Israel failed to accept God's grace, what would happen to our hearts if we were to do the same? Say what? Fall away. Yeah, we'd fall away. The answer would be hell. All right? And then, is this God's choice? No. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You have been chosen by God, set aside. We call that holy. The definition of the word holy is set apart. That's what happened at your baptism. You were set apart by God into his family so that you would then be seen as a child of the Heavenly Father in the face of a world where not everybody is a child of the Heavenly Father. So, Questions, comments, concerns? Ahas, answers, Romans 11, 1 to 10. All right, 11 to 24, since I don't see any hands here. All right, Carol Sue, we're going to get to chapter 12 today. You just watch. So, all right. Yeah, it's not going to happen. So, <laughs> Pastor Tom, you just, I heard you under there. Yeah, so... <laughs> So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles and magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offers its first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. I keep that image in mind. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Know then the kindness and the severity of God. 
severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue to in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if they were cut from what is, na is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? All right, clear as mud, right? Yeah, everybody's like, I should have really gone to an agricultural school to be able to read the Bible, because obviously I need to have a knowledge of olive trees, which none of us actually, I believe, do, because they're not native to Minnesota, all right? So I think if you think about this also in terms of John 15, all right, John 15 is the story of what? I am the vine and you are the branches. So Minnesota does have what? Grapes. Yeah, absolutely. So we can picture what's going on here a little bit more if we use that image as well. But back up to the beginning of the section. The beginning of the section is all about this issue of envy and jealousy which usually has a tendency to have a negative connotation to it. If I am trying to invoke envy in Tom, or envy in Pastor Tom, or jealousy in Pastor Tom here, or anything, that would usually be viewed as a negative thing. However, there can be a positive result to envy and jealousy, and that's what Paul gets at. So how does he utilize envy to attempt to draw the people of Israel back unto himself. How does he do that? And by giving the good news to the Gentiles, and remember, so back up to the beginning of the book, all right, Jews show back up into the church, Gentile Christians have been given and shared the faith, what is the natural response then of the Jews here? Jealousy. Jealousy. We want that. We see that the freedom of the gospel. We desire that for us. We want to be a part of that. I mean, this is if you've ever looked at your neighbor and thought, wow, that's a really nice car. Yeah. I've done that right now. I just had a car break down and stuff and everything. So it was like, yeah, the car is a lot nicer over there and stuff because <laughs> it runs right. Yeah, and stuff and everything. So, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, there's nicer stuff out there. But that's a negative envy, a negative jealousy. In the case of Jews, they're seeing it in a positive, Paul's using it in a positive light because what? Did we hear last week? Paul is so loving towards the Jews that what would do, what did he say he was willing to endure if they could be saved? I will go to hell if it means saving them. So he has this, hey, I'm going to present the gospel to the Gentiles in the hopes that I might be able to even save some of the Jews. So note the use of envy and jealousy here. How can we employ Paul's mathematics to our life of witness? All right, Carol Sue, this is on you. You're the math teacher here. So Paul's mathematics are to raise up as many possible Gentile Christians in order to build up envy in Jews. By doing so, not only will it mean they are more Gentile Christians, there will also be more Jewish Christians as well, thus growing the kingdom all the more. So how can we employ that mathematical equation? Say it. Share the, word. Share the word. Yeah. Share the faith. Yeah. If people actually would know, all right, sometimes there is this negative connotation, I know it comes as a shock, of the church. All right? Church is often viewed as a place that is full of what? Hypocrite. hypocrite. Oh my goodness, you even know it. So, all right, there we go. <laughs> church is full of hypocrites. I still think one of the best answers, actually, Robert Lickie's not here today and everything, but he actually had this come up, and he said, yeah, it is full of hypocrites. It is. We are. We are hypocrites. We do say things and don't follow through. 
There's a good response to that though, right? When we are hypocritical, we confess our hypocrisy. And we say, yeah, I mess up. I don't get this right. I need a Savior. Why don't you come with me and join me and join a bunch of hypocrites? But a bunch of hypocrites who are asking for forgiveness for their hypocrisy. And this is one of the challenges, one of the many challenges in the face of a pandemic. How do we invite people to church right now if we have a limit on how many people who can attend? My mind is going crazy these days trying to figure that one out. How does the church be the church? The answer to that is, is when the church actually is still engaging with its neighbors in light of the gospel. That we're continuing to love and show support and care for them in their time of need. Because if we think we're having a hard time right now, imagine if you have a neighbor right now who has no connection to Christ how despairing and how dark things might seem. We look at it through a lens of the gospel light of Christ. That alters our vantage point big time. Okay? In the agricultural lesson that Paul teaches at the close of this section, what does he desire his hearers to clearly learn? What does he want them to learn? Great. To be grafted in. But who does the grafting? God does the grafting. Know who the farmer is here. The farmer is always God the Father. In the case of the John 15 text, who's the vine? It's Jesus. In the case of this text, all right, if you look at um, verse 18. You look at verse 18, he uses a different language. He says, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the what? The root, but the root that supports you. So who's the root here? Christ and his word. And so this is, all right, so my, one of my favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation, you've probably heard me say this, but there's a reason. How firm a foundation, O saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his what? Excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, who unto his Savior for refuge have fled? What more can he say? He said it all to you in his word, and the root is actually Christ. So, in the case of this lesson, remain ever connected to the root. Yeah. And John 15 does a little bit more in elaborating on this because it really speaks to the importance of the Word as being our source of life. Romans 11, 25 to 36. Lest you be wise in your sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience... So they too have now been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth and rich of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has, been, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I told you at the beginning that this text, really at chapter 11, really ends with the portion on the doctrine here. Portion and then moves into sanctification. You can see that Paul even ordered it that way by ending with a doxological statement there. For from him and through him and to him, to him be glory 
forever and ever, amen. It's a conclusion of a section that moves into another one here. But what has Israel's rejection ultimately led to? What did it lead to? The gospel being shared with the Gentiles. So this is good and it is bad news. All right, you probably heard somebody say that. I've got good news and I've got bad news. All right, the bad news is obvious, right? It's that Israel rejected. The good news is, is that the Gentiles are being welcomed into the faith. And don't think that that's just a New Testament truth. One of our favorite Bible stories is all about the Gentiles being included. There was a gigantic fish. It swallowed a dude and everything. Do you remember that story? Jonah. Jonah goes to what city? Nineveh. Nineveh. You know how many people were in the city of Nineveh? 120,000 people. And it says that all the people repented when Jonah went there. All the people. So God's word went to the Gentiles, even in the Old Testament. And there's numerous other examples as well. But the good news is it goes to the Gentiles. By going to the Gentiles, it creates the envy and then brings more Jews in. Good news and bad news. Fair. Yep, absolutely, yep. Thanksgiving Day is the story of the ten lepers uh, from Luke chapter 17. And, and who's the only one to come back? The Samaritan, yeah. Who hears the gospel? I mean, it's just, yeah, countless times. Yep, the Samaritan woman, I mean, is another example. Uh, that's one of the most beautiful stories whenever you're stuck in a position of, I don't, know how to go about tough conversations in John chapter 4 when he's talking to the woman by the well what does Jesus do first he does not hit her over the head with the law he doesn't start with that he starts by doing what cultivating a relationship so that her ears may be unstopped and be able to hear the word that is proclaimed by the Savior of the what is mercy? What is mercy? God not giving us what we do deserve. God not giving us what we do deserve. There's a distinction here. Grace and mercy. Because we talk about it all the time. Grace, mercy, and peace, and all that. Okay? We talk about that all the time. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. So the acronym that often gets used is God's riches at Christ's expense. So God giving what is not deserved. Mercy is God not giving what we do deserve. Now notice the language in our liturgy. In the Kyrie, what do we pray for? Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. In the dire straits of life, as people come and they talk to me pastorally, this is often the portion of the liturgy that I direct them to, especially as a beginning point of prayer or in times where they are greatly distressed. The Kyrie gives words to what we are going through because it's very simplistic. Lord, help me. That's essentially what it boils down to. Lord, don't give me what I do deserve. I do deserve death and damnation. But, thanks be to God, you have given me grace. But notice, there is a threefold plea. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And it ought to be something, whenever we see something in a trifecta, that we ought to pay careful attention to that. Anytime you see a repeat, we ought to pay a careful attention to that. So when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, Better listen up because it's truly, truly for you. Okay. All right, so mercy, God not giving us what we do deserve. So how does God show it to both Jew and Gentile alike? Because that's for you. How does he show it to Jew and Gentile alike? Yeah, this is universal atonement language. Universal atonement, remember, is Jesus actually sending his son for all people 
not mattering in everything what sort of race or nationality they might be attributed to, God's salvation is for everybody. Okay? So it is for both the Jew and the Gentile alike. Now we know that there are those that will not be saved, but the point here is, is that his mercy is extended to all. To all. We didn't get to chapter 12. Sorry about that. I have given you homework once again. You are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want you to turn real quick to the adventure questions on the back. And then it's got the readings there for you for the upcoming week here as we're nearing the close of the book of Romans. But it says, recognizing that each of us has been gifted by the Lord in proportion to our faith. What does that mean? This is talking about chapter 12, which I know we haven't gotten to yet. But what does that mean when it comes to serving in the church as a family of faith? What does that mean? If we've each been gifted in proportion to our faith. Use them! Yes! We're going to talk about that here in a couple of weeks because it's the story of the talents. And the guy who gets five talents and the other one who gets two and the other guy who gets one and says, Wow, that looks like it'd be fun to bury in the ground. All right? And so, that's actually not what he says in Scripture. But, sometimes I throw in my own interpretations. But anyway, point being here is, God gives us gifts in order to use them. Put them to use. Don't be bashful. Share what you got to share. And the other thing is, is to invite us. Alright, so I told you at the beginning, one of the things that's really pulling at us right now is the very fabrics of our congregation are kind of being pulled apart right now. And that's really hard. But I want everyone to start to really adopt this mentality. This also ties into our governance as well. Of where can I pitch in? And it doesn't matter the size of the task. It doesn't have to be, whoa, that person. Because we don't want to get into a compare contrast thing and say, well, that person does a lot and I don't do anything. Or what I do is so small. No. Just as I tell my kids and everything, you're part of this family and this is how we all contribute to be able to do what to serve the family and also in terms of the church to serve our neighbor and so that when people actually see the love and the gifts that are shared within a family what is the end result Lord willing that other people would want to be a part of the family because they would see it as this is a positive community that they want to be a part of so this is talked about in scripture as we are to be a city set upon a hill. Which doesn't mean we lord it over, but rather we're a place that people can come to where the light of Christ shines. How many people think that's going to be that much more important with each day that passes as we navigate this world? Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> and then the last question there is, what are your gifts? Make a list of them. I was just actually encouraged by a pastor to do this, to just make a list of your gifts, say a prayer and thanksgiving for them, maybe rank the top five of them or something like that so you start to see. My mentor, he tells me, one of the things that people need to really invest themselves in what's called the book of the self, which means really get to know who you are and how you can use your giftedness to better serve others. But it's actually taking a step back and actually assessing what are my gifts and then see where the opportunities then that fit those gifts. All right? There will never be a day that Lyle is going to ask me to help out on the farm. He's just not going to do it because he knows I can't do a thing. Pat's not going to ask me to help fix a car because he knows it's not going to happen. All right? If you're in construction, oh my goodness, don't call me there either. <laughs> Emily fixes everything in our house. Even the high light bulbs because, well... Because she does. <laughs> I want to challenge her. So, Point being is, when we work from our giftedness, there is joy. And that's where it comes down to, is there is joy in using the gifts that God has given us. So, And what's more with that is that when you serve in the midst of your vocations, don't ever discount that either. Because if you are husband, wife, neighbor, friend, parents or otherwise, those are holy, holy callings. And they come first. 
and then the service to the church. But the service of the church really complements that as well. So let's close with a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and always. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.